So we're going to be in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, beginning in verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 12. Here is what the word of God says. This is Apostle Paul speaking. Here's what he says. I have the right to do anything. You say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for the food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body. For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Stay in the same area you're at in your Bibles and just flip over to the the seventh chapter. So it's the very next chapter, beginning in verse 27. If you have a wife, do not seek to end the marriage. If you do not have a wife, do not seek to get married. But if you do get married, it is not a sin. And if a young woman gets married, it is not a sin. However, those who get married at this time will have troubles. And I'm trying to spare you those problems, okay? It's probably the the intonation Paul used. Verse 29, but let me say this, dear brothers and sisters. The time that remains is very short. So from now on, those with wives should not focus only on their marriage. Those who weep or who rejoice or who buy things should not be absorbed by their weeping or their joy or their possessions. Those who use the things of the world should not become attached to them. For this world as we know it will soon pass away. This is the word of the Lord. I'm going to say exactly what you're thinking. This is an outrageous text. What in the world is going on here? Paul, you wrote this such a long time ago. How does it apply to us? It applies incredibly to us. But before we get into that, I want to I start by uh, finding a common narrative with you. Because when I get to the more complex parts of it, I, I would like you to be on board with me. So... I'm a pastor, and my goal is to read Scripture, to understand it, and then to teach it so that when you hear it, you apply it to your everyday life, and you experience joy and flourishing. So in a way, I'm a spiritual doctor. Sometimes you might not like the particular diagnosis, but I also have the cure, okay? So imagine this. Imagine you're walking, and if you've ever had this happen to you, and um you notice that there is a pebble in your shoe. And you're walking, you're walking. If you're running, you're walking. You're like, man, I can't really walk normally because I feel this pebble in my shoe. Well, what's going to happen is um, you'll be able to walk a few miles with a pebble in your shoe, and then you'll begin to notice it, okay? Now, if there's multiple pebbles in your shoe, here's what's going to happen. You're going to get to the point where you're going to stoop down Take your shoe off and take the pebble out there or at least stop, think about it and figure out what in the world is going on. This is exactly what I'm going to do today and that's actually what I do every single Sunday. I'm trying to put pebbles into your shoe, okay? And I'm trying to do it in a way where you get a little bit uncomfortable. You're like, wait a minute, 
But then you stoop down and you start thinking about it and you're like, oh, that makes sense. And that's God working in your heart. So are you guys still with me? Okay. So let's, I want to first talk, uh, talk about uh, freedom, okay? Because when we're talking about this weighty and lofty subject that we all come at from a different perspective, um, I want to talk about freedom. Um, what does it mean for you and I to be free? Um, our society is very happy about saying, I'm free, I can do whatever I want. You know, it's my body, I can do whatever I want. I want freedom. Everybody wants this elusive, uh, strange thing called uh, uh, freedom. And um, I think that um, we, we, don't, we don't define freedom in the right way as we should. So let me give you an example. A fish is only free when it's in the water. If the fish feels free to come out onto the land, what's going to happen? It's going to die, right? Because it was made for water. So the fish can say, I want to be free. I want to go on land. Well, no, if you go on land, the fish is going to die because the fish was made to live in water. So are we really that free or do we really want this freedom? Or is freedom actually a restriction? And what if I was to tell you that restrictions are actually good? They're actually profitable. They actually make your soul wonderful and joyous and beautiful as God created for you to be. So what is freedom, you might ask? Well, I think all of us here would agree that the fish is not free when it is dying. It is free when it has found the right restrictions. So when the fish is functioning in the right restrictions, in the ocean, in the water, it's flourishing, it's thriving. So contrary to what our culture says, contrary to what even you and I might think, freedom is not the absence of restrictions. It is the presence of restrictions. However, it is finding the right restrictions that fit with your nature or who you were created to be. So God created us. Let's start with that kind of a framework. And God created us for something. God gave us freedom to live according to how he created us. And in the confines, the way God created us is the best possible way. If God is our maker, he knows what's best for us. Well, some people, and it might be you this morning, you might say, well, I should be free to live any way that I want without restrictions, with one caveat, as long as I don't harm anybody. So people say, what's wrong with my lifestyle? What am I doing wrong? I'm not harming anybody at all. Well, the question I would ask you is, how do you define harm? It's not just about freedom. You have to have a particular belief about what is right and what is wrong. And if you as a human want to know what is right and what is wrong, you need to go to the author and creator of humans, which is God. And he is the one that sets morality. He is the one that sets right and wrong. Because if we say, God, you are the author of humans, but I'm going to create my own rules, we're actually lying. It's either God is God or you are God. If you are God, you're creating your own rules. If God is God, God is creating his rules that we should follow. And God's rules are much better for us. God created nature in a way where a fish, if it comes out of the water, it's going to die. But if it stays in the water, it's thriving and flourishing. So freedom is not the absence of restrictions. Freedom is finding the right restrictions. That's actually freedom. So in essence, the only people who are truly free are the only people who are functioning in the right restrictions. Are you guys with me? That is what the Bible is talking about. Now, um, here's the uh, uh, biggest frustration that me as a, as a pastor, as a speaker, as a preacher faces every single Sunday when I, when I preach. I believe the word of God is powerful and I believe it can change lives and it can change hearts and it can change behaviors. But I know that, that at the end of the day, many people or most people are not going to change their mind at the end of a message. 
I will speak to you today for a particular amount of time, but I'm not naive enough to think it's going to change your life completely. In fact, if I am naive to think that, it's because I believe in faith and I, and I believe God can, can change your, your mind. Now, most people only change when a crisis happens. When they come to a fork in the road, when they're like, whoa, this is not working how I, how I did things. However, this is what I'm going to say. Um, we need to understand what God says about sex. We need to understand that. So I want to first start by defining what it is. What is, uh, what is uh, sex? And Genesis chapter 2, uh, verses 21 through 24 says this. is this wonderful narrative uh, about the first uh, two people that God created, Adam and Eve. So the Bible says, The Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, This one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. They become one flesh. The two become one uh, person. There is a uh, Hebrew concept called ekad, and ekad is actually uh, where we get the, the concept of oneness from. In fact, um, the, the number one is a cod in Hebrew. And I want to first look at the cultural definition of sex, the way just culture defines it. The way culture defines it is that they say this is recreational play between two consenting adults. So culture says it's just physical, I'm not hurting anybody, what's the big deal? As long as it's two consenting adults doing this, what's wrong? Well, a lot actually, but I'm going to get to that. God's definition, and again, if we want to function out of the right framework, if we want to do according, if we want our life to have joy and happiness and flourishment, if we want to thrive, we need to look to what God says. <clears throat> so God's definition out of Genesis chapter 2, he says the two shall become one flesh. So this word akad, it is a very graphic, weighty term that means it, you are fused together at the deepest level. In sex, a man and a woman come together and are fused together at the deepest level. The bonding of two people into one entity – it's body and soul. It's physical and spiritual. Sex is a full giving of self to the one to whom you belong. A lot of people are like, well, it's just physical. No, it's not. It's not. It's actually much more than that. And so the way the Bible defines it is significantly higher and loftier and better than the way culture defines it. Culture says it is just biological, it is just play, it is just my natural instinct. But God says, no, there's something much more happening there. Two people become a cod, they become one entity. Now, inside of marriage, inside of a marriage between one man and one woman, which is the only kind of marriage that is a real true marriage, this is beautiful. It keeps two people and doesn't let them drift them apart. It keeps them a cod. You have a oneness. But outside of marriage is incredibly dehumanizing. I don't want to show you how. Often it turns people into objects for self-gratification. And so what happens is if you have multiple sexual partners, you have your a cod, the oneness with a person physically. And when you come away from, when you step away from your sexual partner, a piece of you is left with that other person. So the akad that God created for one man and one woman in a marriage to have begins to tear apart. And so what happens is, if you have multiple sexual partners, your akad becomes torn and you become hollow inside. There's no more akad left because you've given it out. To so many different people, part of you is lost. 
And if you do that enough times, it hollows you out from the inside. And so uh, God, contrary to what culture says, contrary to what many uh, philosophers say, God did not just make sex as a way of self-gratification or self-expression. God created sex as a way for us to donate completely us to another person. Completely. Sex was invented by God to give yourself away to someone else so deeply that it results in personal transformation. A lot of people who don't know the Bible will think, man, God is this prude and he doesn't want me to have sex. My friends, God created sex. God is the author of it. If anybody knows how to have the greatest sex, it's God. My wife told me not to say sex a lot during this message, but <laughs> it's just, I'm sorry, honey. <laughs> it's going to happen. Um, so, so, so the point is, people are like, well, you have this weird um, uh, prudish understanding of sex. No, it's not. It's the highest, loftiest, most correct, accurate term because God created it. So here's what happens. In this text we read, now that I have your attention, um, I'm going to use it to the fullest of my ability, okay? This is perfect. Paul is saying, you must never have physical oneness without whole life oneness. Paul is saying, you must not get physically naked with someone unless you have become vulnerable with them with your whole life. Economically, legally, financially, personally, you have completely given up your independence. So what Paul is actually saying is he's saying, look, if you want to have sex with someone, you must be completely giving up your independence, i.e., you must be married to that person. And that is the only condition upon which you can and will and should have sex. Now, I understand that all of us come from all sorts of different backgrounds and we've done all sorts of different things. And that's completely fine because the gospel of Jesus Christ, here's a great thing about the good news of Jesus Christ, that not only exp it exposes who you are and the wrong things you've done, but it creates this, this amazing atmosphere of, of acceptance and, and unconditional forgiveness and unconditional acceptance. So you could have had as many sexual partners as you want, but if you come to God and say, God, you know what? I, I, I want to do it the right way. Please forgive me of my sin and provide for me a brand new future. God will say, Done. That's the gospel. So we don't come to God as, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, God, I, I, did all, I did all these things. No, you did, but God still loves you. God wants what's best for you. I want to talk more about this oneness concept, the ekad. So my wife and I have been uh, married for over 13 years. And so it's going to be actually 14 years in, uh, in September. And it's crazy because... As I'm meeting more and more young people, I feel like I'm just getting older and everybody else just keeps getting younger. I don't know how that's happening. But um, so I do, I, I have been married for a little bit, a few minutes, probably longer, almost 14 years. And I'm going to tell you something. Um, there, is, there is a oneness. So my wife and I have experienced this oneness for almost 14 years. And um, whenever I'm in any social situation, I'm at work, I'm with a business client, and I'm talking to people, I'm going to tell you something. When a situation is, is proposed to me, I have my own mind and how I'm thinking about stuff. But at the very same moment, I know 100% exactly what my wife thinks about that situation. 100%. I bet you anything. If I would call her and be like, honey, look, either we go this way or this way. And she's going to be like, go this way. And I'm like, that's what I knew you were thinking. And if I'm smart... I should take her brain and think with, with it instead of mine. So there's a, there's brownie points right there. Um, 
there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an akkad. So, so the thing is, and if you've been married for a while, you actually, I think you know what I'm talking about. Not only do I have my own instinctive way, how my thoughts work and how I speak, but I know exactly what she would think and what she would do. And I have the option to choose between two modes. So that's basically telling you about this ikad that God is, is calling us to, to, to have that you can have when, when the two uh, become one flesh. Um, but problem is we live in a society, and you do as well, where it's okay to give away your body without giving away yourself. So the society says, give your body, it's just physical, but God said, if you're gonna give your body, you have to give everything you have. You have to completely give up your entire independence. So if somebody says, you know what, I'm really committed to you, but they're not married to you, and they wanna sleep with you, they're not committed to you. They're just lying to you. Let me give you an example. I can tell you that next week I have a dentist appointment. I'm so excited about this dentist appointment. I love my dentist. Oh my goodness. Everything about him is great. We even think alike. And I have a dentist appointment. And when that day comes for the dentist appointment and I wake up and I hit the snooze button and I call the receptionist and I call in sick and I don't go to the dentist appointment, do I love my dentist? No. I have zero loyalty to him. I have zero commitment to him. The only way I can prove to him is if I wake my butt up, okay, sorry, um, all you were thinking it, and so was I, and get in my car, drive to the dentist, get my root canal, or whatever else, God forbid, I need. That is the only way. That's the only way. So to hold to your independence, but to, ki- but to give your body away is the, is the opposite of what a cod is. It's saying, I'll share a room with you, I'll share a house with you, I'll share all this stuff with you, but I'm not going to share my oneness. It's a very a la carte type um, living. So if, when you have sex outside of marriage, you're abusing, dishonoring, and destroying the commitment mechanism of deep soul nurture. You're, when you give your body without giving yourself, you're destroying this apparatus that was created to create a deep work in you. And so Paul here in this text, he has a very high view of sex. We in the secular cultural society in which we live in, did you know that um, our society is the first society that has a widespread belief that there's no ultimate future? There has never been a society on the planet. You study any, any ancient, you study the, the, the Greeks, you study the, the Romans, you study any ancient empire, and every single one of them had a view of the future. There's an afterlife, something's gonna happen, but we are the only society when we think there is no ultimate future. When you die, you go to, ex- you, you, you're, you're extinct. There has never been a society in, in the history of the world that has had such an insignificant view on human life. The one we're living in right now. And there's never been a society that puts such an emphasis on love and romance. Because this is why it happens. If we live in a society where everybody says there is no future, um, there might be a God, but when I die, I'm just going to die and that's about it. So there's no future, so what should I do? I should find something to worship. I should find sex to worship, and that's going to be my God. That's where I'm going to find my fulfillment because pretty much I'm going to die and nothing else is going to happen. We want to merge ourselves with a higher meaning, and if we have no God, then we have a romantic solution. We now look not to God, but to a love partner. And why? Is the rates of people living together and having premarital sex and all this other stuff so high in our society today? Well, because no matter what you think about God, you have a feeling that you want somebody else to look you in the eye and say, I really love you. You want somebody to know you inside and out. You crave and desire to be vulnerable with somebody at any cost. And so that's what we do. We want to get rid of our feelings of nothing. 
We want to feel justified. We want to feel loved. We want to feel accepted. So we give our body away without giving ourselves away. But here's what I'm going to say, that if you don't find true love without sex and love, you can't possibly be satisfied. So, so here's, here's, in other words, uh, Paul is living in a particular society where family was God. We live in an individualistic society where self is God. <clears throat> you don't care much about your family name other than it's your last name. And you might come from a wealthy family or not wealthy family, whatever it is. But in Paul's time, if you were not part of a family, you were nothing. That's why uh, the widows, if you became a widow, the Roman government would fine a widow money if she did not get remarried within three years of her husband passing away. But in the Christian world, in the Christian world, widows were actually taken care of so much so that there was offerings and collections for them and uh, Paul even s- took care of the widows. So the point is that this text we read today about family structure and about sex and all this other stuff, the way Paul looked at it is so much more loftier and higher than any other culture. Now here's what's happened. In the ancient culture, if you were not part of a family, you were nobody. You would be living on the street. But in our culture, if you don't have a romantic love partner, then that's why you're nobody. And so that's the way our two cultures are rather different. So in a traditional, traditional society, if you had no family, you have not had any fulfillment. But in secular society, unless you have sex and romance, you can't be fulfilled. So it's like shows like The Bachelor, Bachelorette, whatever, like Wine Mondays, whoever does that. Um, like th- that. Like those shows are popular because when we watch them, we're like, you know what, I know this is all staged, but I can see myself in this show. And it would be so amazing for somebody to love me as much as this person does. It's fake! It's not true! Nobody's going to pull up in a limo for you. I mean, maybe you will. Maybe you'll be lucky. Um, so so here's, here's what's happening to this. Christians have a higher view of sexuality and we have freedom from the need of it because here's what Paul says. We actually read about this. So basically, um, traditional society said you got to be part of a family in order for your family name to continue. Secular society, the one we live in today, says you know what, you have to have a romantic partner. And Paul says, eh, those aren't really that important. What? Paul is basically attacking the very fundamental concepts of how we and I look at culture. So check out what it says in, ver- uh, in, in chapter 7. Paul says this. He said, to the, to the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with, with passion. Um, Then he says, to the married, the wife should not separate from her husband. So essentially, what Paul is saying, look, if you're married, don't seek not to get married. If you're single, don't seek to get married because your life is going to be a lot harder, a lot harder. Paul's like, I'm warning you right now. Some of us who are married can tell. It's true. It's true. It's a lot of benefits too, but it's sometimes difficult. Um, so what, what Paul is saying is, if you were a single person, there was no single people in, in, in society of Paul. Paul is saying, if you're single, that's completely fine. You can serve the Lord. And if you're married, you can also serve the Lord. So what Paul is basically saying is he's trying to completely turn upside down our concept of how we understand this. And so Paul here in this text, in... Uh, Chapter 6, verse 18, he's saying, have nothing to do with sex sins. Run from sexual sin, flee from sexual immorality, run from sex, flee fornication. So what is Paul saying? Paul is basically saying that God created a cod. 
God created oneness, and the way to experience oneness is in a committed relationship. So if you're giving yourself fully to somebody with your body, but you're not giving them yourself fully with every other aspect of your life, you're actually not giving yourself at all. It's just a basically, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's, it's the worst kind of thing. It is essentially a uh, devaluing of, of the currency. And what happens is um, sex outside of marriage is a lot like um, it becomes a drug and it becomes an addiction because with every time that you do this act, uh, it becomes less and less of what you thought it was going to be because there's no soul connection. There's no ekad happening. You're vulnerable with your bodies, but you're not vulnerable with your soul, which makes you not vulnerable at all. And that's grounds for destruction. So Paul is basically saying, look, when I'm talking about sexual immorality, I'm talking about sex outside of marriage. And he's saying, flee from it. This is a, the word flee, it's a Greek word that is a present imperative. It's a command. It's basically addressing all people and it's saying, run and get away from this kind of thing. You might be saying, well, it's so difficult. Here's what I'm going to say. What God requires, he empowers. So flee, it means scurrying to a place of security. To flee away in the sense of to take flight in order to take safety. To flee in the sense of to avoid. To avoid deliberately and especially habitually. Paul is like, if you are doing anything in your life that is remotely close to having sex with somebody other than your wife or your husband. Do everything you can to run as quickly and as fast as possible away from that and do not do it. That's the, the level of emphasis that Paul is basically saying. Paul is not telling us, hey, be brave and resist the lustful passion of sexual immorality, but flee from its very presence. Run from sin, run from uh, temptation, don't stay and savor it. There's a story in the Old Testament with Joseph where uh, when Joseph was uh, cornered by Potiphar's wife, she wanted to sleep with him, but um, Joseph did not want that. She grabbed him, she begged him to sleep with her. And what Joseph did is he left his coat in her hand and ran, he ran. So if, if you're here this morning and you're sleeping together with somebody other than your wife or your husband, you need to run as far and as fast as possible away from that and, and get married if you, if, you, if you feel inclined to. That's the, that's the thing to do. So Paul here, uh, now a lot of people, they look at this text and they're like, wait a minute, is really the Bible against premarital sex? having sex before, before being uh, married. There's a word that Paul uses here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The word, the word is fornication. When we think of fornication, all we think of like Californication, right? I think of that when I think of that word. But nobody really uses that word be- at, at all. People know what adultery is because people think, oh, adultery, well, I'm sleeping with this person and they're not my wife or my husband, therefore, I'm not committing adultery, awesome. No, not awesome. Uh, The word here is is fornication. It's actually, um, in Greek, it's the word porneia. We actually get our English word pornography from it. And he's saying, stay away from anything that resembles anything like you having sexual relations with somebody other than your wife or husband. And I want to say that The Bible says that your body and your soul are more connected than you think. Sex is a complete nakedness with somebody. So the Bible is saying you shouldn't do with your body what you're not going to do with the rest of your life. To be naked means to be completely vulnerable and to be one, to be a cod. In other words, if you say that I want to have bodily oneness with you, but I don't want to have economic oneness. I don't want to have legal oneness. I don't want to actually be truly vulnerable with you. Basically, you're saying to the person, I don't want to commit to you forever. I don't want to get up in front of the authority structures in our state and get married. 
So, if, so the point that Paul's saying is that if you're, if you're trying to be vulnerable with your body, but not vulnerable with your soul, you're actually lying. You're doing a disservice to your partner, a great disservice to them. So you might ask, what is wrong with sex outside of marriage? What in the world? What a, it's like, what a prudish thing to talk about in the middle of Irvine in Orange County. Come on, two consenting adults. We're not hurting anybody. No, you are. You're hurting yourself. The Bible says this, that God invented sex as a way to say to somebody else, I belong completely and exclusively to you. So if you use sex to say something else, you really destroy the ability for sex to work because sex is a renewal ceremony. That's what it is. Now, I might ruffle some feathers of people who may be more churched or uh, whatever, but it's okay because this is biblical. Sex between a husband and a wife is the same role as the Lord's Supper between God and the believer. Next Sunday, we're going to do the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, when we take the, the juice and the cracker and we, and we recollect what Jesus did for us, the Lord's Supper is going back and renewing the original covenant. Jesus Christ dies. That's the bridge between me and God. What's the purpose of the Lord's Supper? The Lord's Supper is to get the intimacy back by renewing the covenant, reliving the idea of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Do this as a promise that you love me. Do this so that it's top of mind. So when a husband and wife is experiencing, uh, when, they're, when, they're, when they're experiencing sex, they are reliving their marriage vows. They're in essence saying, I promise that everything I have, my oneness, legally, economically, my bank account, socially, everything is yours. I've completely given up my independence. I'm no longer an individual. I am a cod. I am one with you, not just physically, but in every way possible. And God's like, this is the only way it should work. And if you're not doing it in this way, you'll be like that fish that is out of water, slowly dying. That's what Paul is saying. That's what, that's what Jesus is saying. So in essence, he's not trying to take the fun out of it. He's actually trying to inject it with as much fun as possible. Because if you talk to anybody and you say, hey, have you had sex with somebody who you're not married to? And then have you had sex with somebody who you're married to and you actually have a really good relationship with you? I bet you anything the sex with the person who you're married to and you love them and you have a cod with them is infinitely better. So you're going back and you're redoing your marriage. You're getting naked. You're becoming vulnerable. And you say to your spouse, look, I belong to you. I belong completely to you. I belong exclusively to you. I can't make an independent decision. I am legally one with you. I am financially one with you. So sex is supposed to be a renewal of covenants or promises that you have made to each other. Here's what I'm going to say. If instead you don't use it this way, sex is not going to operate the way it's supposed to operate. So if you have sex with someone that you're not totally and absolutely committed to, in every area, financial, legal, emotional, you ruin its ability to do what it has been intended for. So what you're doing is you're devaluing it. Well, you might be saying, well, uh, why not? I have these desires. Your desires are not served well by sex until it is mirroring and until it is actually a renewal of the covenant. If you don't have a covenant to renew, it won't do what it's intended to do. Are you guys still with me? So sex outside of marriage can be exciting, but it can't be enriching. You're using it in the wrong way. Um, there's the social scientists have been studying this. Uh, secular scientists have been studying this. And what's incredible about the culture we live in today is like literally everything that was abnormal or strange before now, our culture is like, it's the best thing ever, and that's what happens. And um, cohabitation or living together before getting married. Here's the 
interesting part. There's more people living together now than there has been in any, in any, uh, uh, in any time in history. And I started doing research on this, and did you know what? That in, in our culture, in our timeline today, the, instead of the, the ring being a symbol of I want to get married to you or I want to be with you, it's now the key. It's the key. It's the key to your place. So before people were like, okay, I got to get a ring, I got to propose, I got to get engaged, I got to get married. But now it's like, instead of the ring, it's the key. It's like, hey, let's live together before we get married. So you might say, what's wrong with that? Um, studies from the 1980s and in now, until now, all studies unanimously say that living together with your partner Cohabitating with your partner leads to more divorces, more breakups, more damage for each partner. And here's what happens in cohabitation um, situations. When somebody's living together with somebody else and uh, um, they're not husband and wife, they're, 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 not, they, they're not legally married. Um, cohabitors have a hazard of disillusion. Um, the probability of them breaking up is 46% higher than people who wait to move in when they get married. Almost 50% more likely. So imagine this, okay? Imagine you're not married right now, okay? Imagine somebody came to you and said, hey, if you move in with your partner, you have a 50% higher rate of this not working out if you move in before marriage. Do you want to do it or not? Well, if we were smart, we'd be like, of course not. So statistics speak against cohabitating. Now, if you truly love your partner, if you truly love them, you will want to do what's best for them. You will want to line up your relationship for flourishing. And actually, statistics say that 80% of couples that cohabitate end up breaking up before marriage or divorce. 80%. 80%. Some, some people are like, well, what do I do? I'm living together now. Stop. Easy. Now. Well, I'm going to have to rent my own apartment. Yeah. Go do it. <laughs> it's simple. Well, uh, but I don't know about, well, yeah, but God said it. Well, but I really want a lasting. I want a cut. I want, you know, I want, I want this person to love me after we've been married for 60 years. Yeah, well, you have to do it God's way. 12% of couples that cohabitate and then get married last past the 10 years in marriage. Now, this is, not a, this is not a thing that you want to strive towards. You're like, oh my gosh, yes, I'm going to be the 12%. It's not, that's not the goal. So if you get married and you were living together before, you have only one in 10 chance of it actually working out. Some of you are like, well... No, th this isn't even the Bible saying it. It's secular s scientists and, and, and s like this is the Atlantic and the Guardian. Like, can we get more liberal? Like, I think they're liberal. Um, <clears throat> anyway, it's like, so, so, so the point is living together before marriage is actually saying, let's take all the benefits but not have all the responsibilities. Now, here's what our society tends to say. They're like, well... What about sexual compatibility? People are like, how do I know that I'm going to be able to be sexually compatible with my partner? People say, well, you have to test drive a car, so to speak, before you buy it, so why not do it with a partner? Let's just first put that horrific argument to death right away, because the minute you begin thinking about humans as cars, we actually aren't cars, we aren't commodities. That's the wrong way of thinking about it. We are a cod. We are, we, are, we are a soul that God created. So when you live together and you're not married, here's what you're saying to your partner. You might have never articulated it this way, but this is exactly what you're saying with your actions. You're saying, I'm a dispenser of sexual goods and services, recreational goods and services, and companion goods and services. If I think your products are a good deal for the price, I'll be very happy to stay with you. So this is all built not on commitment, but on consuming. And hey, as an added benefit for me and not the partner, because we have no legal marriage, I can back out at any moment and there's no legal ramifications. 
Having sex with somebody you're not married to is not preparation for having sex with somebody you are married to. In fact, it teaches you all the wrong things because when you're living with somebody who could walk at any time, you're still in a promotion and marketing phase. You have to be, and you can't really be vulnerable. You're not actually going to tell everything to the other person because you're afraid they might leave, and they will because there's nothing holding them, not even a marriage certificate. So it's, it's a very selfish way of looking at it. Now, um, people might say, wow, it's amazing you would marry somebody not knowing whether you're sexually compatible with them. That is such a different view of sex. You're right. It is a different view of sex. And uh, 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 people are often saying, um, how do I know if I'm compatible with this person? I'm going to tell you guys something. Like, Sex is great, but that marriage is not all about sex. Because, think about it, people say, well, I don't know who I'm getting married to. You, or people say, I want to get married to the right person. Listen to me. If you got married, you got married to the wrong person. And if you don't know it yet, just give it a couple more years. Just give it a cup because we're going to be like, wait a minute. I got married to this guy who was bringing me flowers and roses and date nights. And like with each year, less and less. And who is this person? If you say, I don't want to get married to you, but I want to be completely vulnerable with you. That's a lie. That's a little bit like saying, I want to be good, but I also want to be bad. I want to be short, but I also want to be long. So my wife and I are deciding where to eat once, and she says to me, she's okay, where do you want to go eat? I'm like, I don't know, where do you want to go eat? Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Actually, there's a trick. You say, surprise me, and then the first word she says, you say that's the one she needs to go to, and then you go there. Different topic. Okay. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you, I'm like, honey, where do you want to go eat? She's like, she's like, I don't know where, but I'm going to describe it to you. I'm like, perfect. Come on. I'm good with questions, with the solutions, whatever. She's like, I want something that has no carbs, but I also don't want a salad. I'm like, what? I'm like, no, you either get a pizza or you get a salad, but you can't have neither. It's either one or the other. I'm like, look, honey, we're going to have a pizza or we're going to have a salad. But there's nothing that doesn't have carbs, and it's not a salad. Like, I just don't know if that exists. So the point, what I'm trying to make here is, when you say, I want to hold on to my life, I want to get out when I want to get out, I want to be vulnerable and get naked with you, you're pretty much lying to your partner. So the most important thing is to say, sex is an outgrowth of a relationship. The relationship is not an outgrowth of the sex. You start with a relationship in order to have great sex. You don't start with the sex in order to have great relationship because if you start with the sex, your relationship will probably end badly. It's the wrong way to start it. It's, it, it's the concept of doing things God's way. Now, I really want to talk about compatibility here. I'm going to come back to it because um, we think this, this Western notion. It's like at some point in my life, when I, when I visit, when I talk to some of my friends who are not from America and they're like, we had an arranged marriage. I'm like, that is an incredible idea. Because somebody else decided for you and they were smarter than you. They were so much smarter because in the Western world, we're like, we want to find Mr. Right or Mrs. Right. They don't exist. Here's the truth. We always marry the wrong person. We never know who it is we marry. We just think we do. And even if we marry the right person, just give it a while and they will change. So the great challenge is learning to know and love the stranger to whom you often find yourself married to. That's the point. Sometimes my wife is like, who are you and what did you do with Mr. Kipko? I'm like, I don't know. There's an older minister that said this. He said, um, he was like in his 80s when he said this. He said, look, 
my wife has lived with at least five different men since we were married, and each of the five was me. If you're married, if you've been married for any length of time, you change sexually over and over again. You physically change. You don't have the same body as you did before. Like, I'm uglier now than what I was when I first met Victoria. And when we were dating. I had like, I don't know, like 19, 20 inch biceps when we were dating. I went to Venice Beach when I visited Victoria and I was working out with guys in Venice Beach. Very hard for all of you guys to believe looking at my weak, frail body now, but it existed. <laughs> and now I have to work hard every day to look as good as I look. It's tough. Exercising, spin bike, not eating carbs or a salad. I mean, come on. You guys understand what I have to go through every day. So if we understand about our, about our uh, current spouses that we're married to or about our future spouses that we want to get married to, you'll realize you're not looking for finished works of sculpture, but you're looking for great blocks of marble. You're not looking for a beautiful sculpture. You're looking for a great block of marble. And so if you're here and you're like, well, you know what? Sexual compatibility is the basis of the relationship. You might as well say, you know what? Hey, you're cool, I'm gonna have sex with you, but only for four years, let's sign a contract. After four years, I'm done. Because I know you're gonna change. It's a term limit on the marriage. Some of you are like, well, that's a very cynical way of looking at it. But that's the true way of looking at it. I love what one uh, gentleman said. He said, men are so worried that marriage will leave them with only one woman for the rest of their lives. He said, that's simply not true. He goes on to say, I fell in love with a 19-year-old rock climber I married a 20-year-old animal lover. I started a family with a 24-year-old mother, then built a farm with a 25-year-old homemaker, and today I'm married to a 27-year-old woman of wisdom. If your mind is healthy, you will never get tired of, quote, one woman. You'll actually become overwhelmed with how many beautiful versions of her you get to marry over the years. Don't say no to marriage, say yes, and keep on saying yes until the day you die. That's how we must look at it. Now, a lot of people say, okay, but isn't marriage just a piece of paper? It's just a certificate. People say, well, what's the point? It's just... We already love each other. No, you don't, because if you did, you would, you, would, you would have no problem in having a marriage certificate. So people say, well, marriage is just a piece of paper. My thing is like, why don't you just go get it? It's just a piece of paper. The, where's the Santa Ana courthouse? Like, it's, we got our marriage license there. Just go get one. First argument. Second argument, people say it's just a piece of paper. I'm like, well, yeah, but so is money, but you get up and you work hard for it every single day. Oh, it means nothing. Uh, Well, yeah, but actually, no, it does mean a lot. Now, and the third argument is, people say, well, it's it's just a piece of paper. My friends, the amount of legislation in different groups in our country and in this state trying to get marriage equality, that is, in a way, actually a, a great disservice we do to those people who we might not agree with, but we respect them. It's a great disservice for us to say that it's just a piece of paper because they're like, I'm fighting for my political rights to be married in this country. And we're saying it's just a piece of paper. That's why this argument holds no merit. It's not an intellectual argument. It's not a good argument. So we, we see what Paul is saying here, that it's just it's this ikad about being married. So uh, uh, having sex outside of marriage, it's like a devaluation of the currency. It becomes less and less powerful and less and less pleasure- pleasurable. Why? Because the physical concept will cease and you need something else to continue. And that's that akkad. That's the oneness that God is offering us. And so in a marriage with years, it gets better and more powerful. Why? Because you have not devalued the currency. So sex is a way of saying to another person, I belong completely and exclusively and permanently to you. And that's something you can only say inside of marriage. Now, I 
I want to finish with this. Here's why everything we heard today is such great news. Here's why the gospel of Jesus Christ is such great, great news. Our view of sex, our view of marriage, needs to be radically shaped by our hope in the ultimate lover, and his name is Jesus Christ. The Bible said here, whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. There's a wonderful story in the Gospels. When Jesus came to speak to a woman who was sitting at the well, he said to her, he said, I have living water that if you drink it, you will never thirst again. And the woman at the well says to Jesus, let me have that water. He says, okay, get your husband to come here. And she says, I don't have a husband. And he says, no, you have had five husbands and the person you're living with right now is not your husband. Now, I would like to pose a question to you right now. Why in the world would Jesus turn to her romantic life when they were speaking about water? Why would, when she asked about water, Jesus started talking about her sex life? Jesus is saying, you have been looking for the water of life in love, in romance, and in sex, but unless you make me your one true love, you will never find what you are looking for. So my friends, unless you make Jesus your one true love, your marriage and your love view will be distorted. You're going to be either too desperate for romance and you'll stay with the wrong people and you'll smother them with expectations under which they will be crushed or you will be so scared and cynical about marriage that you will never even pursue it. So Jesus says, make me your own true love or you will never know love. My friends, Jesus is the ultimate lover that we're after. And Paul is saying that human sexuality is a dim reflection of what it will be like to fall into the arms of the Lord on the final day. That is the lover that we need. So my question I want to ask you is, imagine what it must be like to finally get the spouse, the partner, the husband or the wife, our hearts are looking for, the one that accepts us, the one that loves us, the one that deeply understands us. My friends, that person is Jesus Christ. This is why I'm talking to you about this. Do you not see now why the idea of sex having to be only in marriage, it's not narrow-mindedness. It's not prudery. It's not some conservative Republican way of looking at things. No, you can't have intimacy with God unless you lose your independence. And if sexuality is a reflection of our relationship with God, you cannot have intimacy with God without losing your independence. And my friends, this is exactly what God did. God became vulnerable with us. God came to earth as a human. How much more vulnerable can you be? And so when God went to the cross in Jesus Christ, he bent down on one knee and he proposed to us. That's the gospel. That's Jesus that says, look, if you understand the love I had for you and that I'm the ultimate example of the lover that lays down my life for you, that, that becomes independent and comes from heaven to earth. And this is the model for love and friendship and sex and, and relationships. My friends, why would you not want this? This is what God wants for you. And this is why the gospel is so great that it, it, it finds you where you are, but it doesn't just leave you where you are. The gospel says, I know how sinful you are, but I still love you and I want what's best for you. That's Jesus speaking to me and to you right now. He's saying, I understand what you've done. I understand where you've been, but I still love you. And I want to give you a fresh start. If God could not enter into intimacy with us without losing his independence, we can't take sex and say, I want to have sex with you, but I want to keep my independence. I want to keep my hands on my life. My friends, what I talked about today, there is no difference of opinion about this particular subject among Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, I can meet with my Orthodox and Catholic friends, and guess what? We all would be saying exactly the same thing. We disagree on a lot of other things, but we agree on this. 
So Jesus Christ says this. He's asking you today, make me your one true love and everything will be all right. So if you're happily married today, you need to have Jesus or you'll be too dependent on the other person for your happiness. If you're unhappily married, you need Jesus or you will be in despair. If you are somebody today who is living together, this is the day when you say, God, I want to live according to what you want me to do and I will stop living together. And if this is the person I'm going to marry, I'm going to make arrangements in order to marry this person. If somebody's saying, you know what? I can't afford to get married. No problem. I'll officiate your wedding for free. Done deal. So there's no excuse for that. So on the cross, Jesus Christ proposed to us. He lost his independence. He became vulnerable. And Jesus gave ourselves. Jesus gave himself to us, just like we should give ourselves to the people in our life who we're married to.